Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Martian by Andy Weir. So this was a buddy read. I will let you know who I buddy read it with in a bit, because we'll go through the email chain and check some of their thoughts as well. First off, I will read you the blurb. I'm stranded on Mars. I have no way to communicate with Earth. If the oxygenator breaks down, I'll suffocate. If the water reclaimer breaks down, I'll die of thirst. If the habitat breaches, I'll just kind of explode. If none of these things happen, I'll eventually run out of food and starve to death. I'm screwed. Before going into this, I have seen the movie, I'd already seen the movie, and I did enjoy it. What I will say is after having read this, I'm quite impressed by how accurate the movie portrayed it. The movie is the book as a movie, if you know what I mean. It's really well done, I think, how it's been ported. It's, it's been quite humorous throughout, and again, I kind of knew that was coming. I know a lot of people really love this book, so what I didn't know before going into this was that it was originally self-published. Originally self-published by Andy Weir in 2013. First published in the US by the Crown Publishing Group, a division of Random House Inc. And then in, in the UK it was by Del Rey, which is an imprint of Ebury Publishing, which is also owned by Random House. I, I enjoyed it. Now, I'm going to go through and pull out some of these little tabs so we'll see what we've got here. I like that it actually has the sense of humour in it as, a sen as like a gallows humour. So for example, here when he's talking about uh, starving to death, he says, The medical area has morphine for emergencies and there's enough there for a lethal dose. I'm not going to slowly starve to death, I'll tell you that. If I get to that point, I'll take an easier way out. And we have a similar thing later on as well where... Uh, the spaceship that kind of his crew effectively accidentally abandoned him on Mars and they do this thing where they come back to Earth and then they loop around like that and then they use the momentum to go back to Mars and while they do that they pick up some food supplies but the people on board the ship know that if they miss the rendezvous, the rendezvous with the food supply thing they're screwed, they're not going to survive because they can't exactly just turn around or whatever. So, as well as Watney being at risk with not having enough food and famously growing his own potatoes, the ship that goes back to him are also at risk. Basically, the youngest member of the crew will be given priority and the others will all have to die. The other five crew members will have to die so that it can focus on just keeping her alive. But she still wouldn't have enough food so she would have to eat her crew members. And she's just casually talking about that because that's a possibility, that might happen. They, you know, they have to consider all of the worst case scenarios. And that's why I like it because it gets delightfully bleak. Here we have a, a sort of an example of the sense of humor that Watney has, so uh, he says, as you can see, this plan provides many opportunities for me to die in a fiery explosion. First, hydrazine is some serious death. If I make any mistakes, there'll be nothing left but the Mark Watney Memorial Cart Crater where the Hab once stood. If you asked every engineer at NASA what the worst scenario for the Hab was, they'd all answer, fire. If you'd asked them what the result would be, they'd answer, death by fire. Okay, then we get up to, as of chapter 6, which is about six, a sixth of the way through, 15-20% of the way through, we're suddenly back on Earth. And even though I'd seen the movie, I'd forgot that this happened and that you see both points of view. And to begin with, I found it kind of jarring, but I got used to it as it went on, because you do kind of get used to going between Earth and space. So, for example, at the end of that chapter on Earth, somebody says, uh, it says, uh, he turned to Venka. I wonder what he's thinking right now. And then we go back to Watney on Mars. Log entry, Soul 61. How come Aquaman can control whales? They're mammals. Makes no sense. We also get this bit that a lot of us in the read-along were very excited about, so it says, After all that physical labour, I deserved a break. I rifled through Johansson's computer today and found an endless supply of digital books. Looks like she's a big fan of Agatha Christie. The Beatles, Christie. I guess she's an Anglophile or something. I remember liking Hercule Poirot TV specials back when I was a kid. I'll start with The Mysterious Affair at Styles. Looks like that's the first one. It is the first one, yes. We have this great little conversation here. E and he said, putting her phone away. You shouldn't say things like bring him home alive. It reminds people he might die. Think they're going to forget that? You ask my opinion. Don't like it? Go fuck yourself. You're such a delicate flower, Annie. How would you end up NASA's director of public relations? Re How would you end up NASA's director of media relations? Beats the fuck out of me, Annie said. I like Annie. She is cool. We have this great bit where the Postal Service, they publish memorial stamps for Mark Watney. And then obviously it turns out he's alive and they didn't realise it. And it's the first time that's ever happened that they printed stamps of somebody alive. Because they deliberately only do dead people, you know. So they had to recall them. 
We also have another thing I thought was quite jarring. So chapter 12, we start with Watney slept peacefully in his bunk. He's shifted slightly as some pleasant dream, put a smile on his face, blah, blah, blah. And then we realise that it's actually in the past tense. So even though the whole book is <laughs> kind of written like that, I don't know, it was just jarring for me that we go from him being on Mars and then suddenly in this chapter, he's it's before then. And I didn't necessarily realise that. So it took me a while to realise that we had jumped backwards in time. So again, it was just a little jarring for me. We have this character called uh, Rich, who basically he asks people, <laughs> he asks people to let him know when he's being is awkward because he doesn't necessarily know. And I enjoyed that. I like the fact they, back on Earth, they call it uh, Project Elrond. This is the project to save Watney. And it's named after the Council of Elrond from Lord of the Rings. And then Annie goes, none of you got laid in high school, did you? And I, I don't know, I think that you know, knowing who Elrond is, I think that's just popular culture now. I don't think that's necessarily a geek thing. We have a sad thing with uh, the, I think it's German, one of the astronauts, Vogel, from the crew that Watney was originally with, who then go back around to find him. He, he is in this awkward position because he, he basically, obviously he makes the decision to continue with this mission and to go and try and save Watney. But his mom on Earth has dementia, I believe, or... Um, uh, Alzheimer's or something like that and so he's kind of talking to the people back on earth asking for a progress report I mean I kind of liked it there were some little bits like there was a little bit of a romance between the the crew of what is it the Ares 4 I think it is yeah it's the Ares 3 that's the initial flight and then Ares 4 was the next mission that was planned and I do like they have um they have like a relationship like a love relationship between two of the characters but I think it's fine like, I don't really like romance in books, and I did worry when it came up that it was going to be a problem with this and that it was going to distract from the narrative. But no, it worked fine. It just sort of sat alongside it. It was fine. This is a little bit of Watney's thought process, and I do actually remember this from the movie as well. So this is uh, Log Entry, Soul 381. I've been thinking about laws on Mars. Yeah, I know. It's a stupid thing to think about, but I have a lot of free time. There's an international treaty saying no country can lay claim to anything that's not on Earth. And by another treaty, if you're not in any country's territory, maritime law applies. So Mars is international waters. NASA is an American non-military organization and it owns the HAB. So while I'm in the HAB, American law applies. As soon as I step outside, I'm in international waters. Then when I get in the rover, I'm back to American law. Here's the cool part. I will eventually go to Schiaparelli and commandeer the Ares 4 lander. Nobody explicitly gave me permission to do this, and they can't until I'm aboard Ares 4 and operating the comm system. After I board Ares 4, before talking to NASA, I will take control of a craft in international waters without permission. That makes me a pirate. A space pirate. Then there is the point where basically this, this mission on board the Ares 3, the uh, two of them who are who do have a thing for each other, they, they kind of get given permission to do it by the commander. I mean, the commander points out that technically they're mutineering anyway, so she's not really in control. But they realise that means they get to join the Million Mile High Club, which is all well and good. But another thing is, is I've actually happened to have seen a, a video where people talk about whether astronauts are allowed to have sex in space, and I'm pretty sure they're not, because all of the bodily fluids and the sweat and all this stuff, it, it mucks up the, you know... The instruments so to speak let me get to he he starts reading he reads 80 pages of evil under the sun which is another agatha christie book we have another example of like the brutally real thinking that watney and nasa kind of have to do to make these plans so uh he says here i face the very real possibility that i'll die today can't say i like it it wouldn't be so bad if the mav blew up i wouldn't know what hit me but if i miss the intercept i'll just float around in space until i've run out of air i have a contingency plan for that I'll drop the oxygen mixture to zero and breathe pure nitrogen until I suffocate. It wouldn't feel bad. The lungs don't have the ability to sense lack of oxygen. I'd just get tired, fall asleep, then die. Well, at least he's got his plan sorted, you know? So, that's all of the bits that I tabbed out in the book to talk about. I want to quickly check my emails and talk about this buddy read. So this was the second of the buddy reads that I've been doing as uh, off the back of my, you know, 10 books I want to buddy read video that worked very well. Okay, this is a long old email trail, so let me see who we have got in here. So we have Lisa's West Coast Reads, Mindy's Book Journey, Bookish Mel, Lou G, 
who doesn't have a YouTube channel but who should have one. I say that every time I mention her on my channel, which has been a lot recently. So hi Lou, how you doing? Then we have Cozy Reader Kelly. We have Brian from B Brian's Bookshelves. And I think that's it. So we'll go through and see what people said. Oh, we have uh, Megan Lalonde as well, who joined us. So let's see, here we go, I have some feedback. So Megan, she said, uh, this book, it is basically dripping with sarcasm and I'm in love. Also, I live in Houston, Texas and I can't help but chuckle a little bit when it talks about Houston and the Space Center, simply referring to Houston as an entity itself, instead of just the location of all the individuals controlling and overlooking the safety and well-being of the crew, makes me happy. Plus the science and math with humor. I have scared my dog by actually laughing out loud at his narration and sarcasm intertwined with all the science. Needless to say, I'm hooked. I need to refrain from flying through this one. We were also having a good laugh because Brian <laughs> Brian had a young adult edition with the uh, with like the language changed slightly. So uh, we asked him what the opening line is. And he said, the opening line, I'm pretty much screwed. That's my considered opinion, screwed. So as for me, I have, I'm pretty much fucked. That's my considered opinion, fucked. He said, there are also lots of references to poop. He said, it reads like a science lesson, but keeps the tension and is more humorous than I expected. We have Buckish Mel here. She said, I think I'm in love with Mark. He is so hilarious. I've been listening on Audible and the narrator is fantastic. Brian got super excited about the Agatha Christie things as well. So he said, Mark is reading Agatha Christie. If you have seen my booktube channel, you will know I am a huge Christie fan. So this just made my day. He said he enjoyed the Earth POV section as it adds extra tension to the situation as they know he's alive. So I responded in that. I thought it was jarring at first, but then I enjoyed it. I kind of got more used to it. We have Lou as well. She said, I loved the part about the Agatha Christie books. Don't remember if that was mentioned in the movie or not. As much as I'm enjoying the book, I feel like I'm reading at a snail's pace. Perhaps it's because my little grey cells are trying to take in too much science-y info. Ha <laughs> ha. That was my Belgian accent. Thank you. I will say, from my point of view, I did think it, it took me longer to read it than I was expecting, but that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Like when I read The Book Thief before this, it kind of dragged and I didn't enjoy it too much. Whereas when we read The Martian, I car just went past playing reggae music. It did go a little bit slow, but you know, it was fine. I thought it, it, there wasn't a problem with pacing or anything like that. I enjoyed the fact that I you know, took my time with it. We have Lou mentioned, she said, I know this is random, but a childhood friend of mine works at NASA in the JPL at the Huntsville, Alabama location. And it's kind of cool to read about it. Kelly said, I'm moving a bit slow because sometimes I have to reread the science parts to understand. But I'm really enjoying Mark's voice in the journal logs. I haven't seen the movie, so I have no idea what happens and I'm really excited to see what unfolds. I personally did find that some of the technical bits I kind of glazed over. I had also seen the movie as well, but I don't think it was a problem that I'd seen the movie as well. I was still hooked to reading it, you know. Mel said, I'm really enjoying it, but I've been glazing over the technical bits too. Just about to drop my devil child off at nursery, then I'll be carrying on. I didn't expect it to be such a funny read. Brian mentioned, he said, I'm trusting that all the science is correct. There are a few videos on YouTube about the science of the Martian, which I may watch after, but I'm scared in case it, it spoils this great book. He said, Mel, I agree the humour took me by surprise as well. For someone in such a stressful situation, his journal could almost read like the sitcom Red Dwarf, which is one of my favourite sitcoms. I have seen a few science of the Martian videos as well, and from what I understand, most of it is pretty much correct. Mindy said here, from what I hear, most of the science in the book is correct. I haven't done a lot of research though. One thing he took liberties on was the sandstorm. There are huge sandstorms on Mars, but the atmosphere is so thin that it wouldn't have pushed things around like that but he needed that for the book to work. Cozy Reader Kelly described it as like Castaway on Mars, but so much better because she loves his personality. It's funny because the Financial Times called it Gravity Meets Robinson Crusoe, which is also kind of accurate. Megan said she was hooked. So does Lisa. Lou's got 100 pages left. Brian said it was a five star read for him. He said the last 100 pages are amazing and I felt breathless reading them. I need to calm down now. Lou said, I have just finished as well. Wow. And that brings us up to now. Wow. So I'm going to give it my rating. I gave it a 4.5 out of 5. It wasn't quite a 5, but it was very close. I think the hype is very justified. I think for something that was originally indie published, it's phenomenal. Makes perfect sense to make a movie of it. And if you haven't re read it yet, I would suggest reading it. 
So yeah, so on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought if you read this book. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.